Word of God off the page and into your life. Author and lawyer Tammy Weiser shares strategies for engaging God's Word and transforming our lives. And is it true that focusing on Christian do's and don'ts can lead to a life of legalism? Well, Pastor Jamie Snyder answers that question later on in the show. And Middle East correspondent Brian Bush is standing by with an update from Jerusalem. We want you to stay with us. The Harvest Show starts right now. And welcome to The Harvest Show. Stefan Radulich here alongside Chuck Freeby and the venerable, lovely and talented Miss Valerie Lowe on set in studio today. Pete Sumrall, we're going to be hearing from him in just a moment as he is out in the Middle East with our tour group there in the land of Israel. Going to have a fantastic time this week and uh, really is a trip of a lifetime. Look forward to those updates. And I just got back from Uganda and what a tremendous time we had there checking in and one of the uh, refugee camps where Feed the Hungry is working, seeing some lives change and seeing some children uh, now getting the opportunity to live a full life. So about how many lives do you, lives do you think you were able well, to in, touch? Well, in Uganda, mm -hmm. just close to 25,000 children are wow. in our daily meal program and mm -hmm. in the Rwanda resettlement camp, which is full of uh, Congolese refugee children, about 16,000 roughly, about uh, 7,000 or so in, um, in a place called Kiriandango. Had to follow up with one young lady that we'd met before from the Sudanese camp, her name is Violet, just a sweet little girl, mm -hmm. and uh, she's now in a boarding school. That was her prayer, her dream, her desire was that, and to know that her mother was okay. When they left the Sudan, uh, she basically escaped out of the back of the house mm -hmm. with one of her sisters, found an aunt. They made their way 400 miles wow. to the refugee camp in, uh, in Uganda and uh, never heard from or seen her mom, didn't know Aww. if she was okay, if anything mm -hmm. had happened, if she was still alive. Well, mom's now in the camp, so praise, praise God for God. that. And uh, Vi Violet is uh, at a school and uh, really opened up. She's very closed emotionally because of the things she's seen and the trauma sure. she suffered. But she began to open up, and as we got to know one another, and uh, asked her, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to do next, Violet? She said, I want to go to America. <laughs> I said, doesn't everybody? Uh, and I said, why? She said, so uh, I can further my education there. Mm -hmm. She's a bright, bright girl. She speaks four languages, uh, Arabic mm -hmm. and... Wow. Uh, yeah, Lugandan and uh, 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 Swahili and, uh, and Dinka, and uh, good at math as well. And I said, why? She said, so I can further my education, and I want to tell people what's going on here in Africa. Mm -hmm. People need to know what's happening here in Africa, what's happening in the Sudan, and I hopefully can help others, inspire others to help children like me. And uh, that was a powerful moment. A little bit later on, I talked to her. I said, well, Violet, you know, we've been kind of taking your picture and you know, kind of getting your story on video. I said, we're going to be telling, you know, that's a dream you've got for the future. But uh, you're actually fulfilling that dream right now because uh, you're going to be telling a lot of people your story about what's happening in the Sudan mm -hmm. and how they can help other children. And, man, she just beamed. You know, and it's amazing to see God moving I know. Uh, and answering her prayers and kind of directing her life, even in that position and place where she's at. And while we're here, you know, doing the Harvest Show, that must be really fulfilling, Chuck, for him and for, yeah. and, it, and, it, and we're excited to see that Feed the Hungry is touching lives like that, regardless of where we are. Just so yeah. glad you were able to do that work as well. So happy to do it last week. Okay, and, uh, I'll get your paper. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but it's nice that the Harvest Show could be the vehicle yes. where that story yeah, was told. So don't, yeah, absolutely. Please, don't make it sound no, like we're no. not worthwhile. And we'll see broadcasting <laughs> as well. You know, we share that story across uh, the That's broadcasting right. network. And, and uh, speaking of which, we want to take a quick moment and join up with our president and CEO, Mr. Peter Sumrall, who is standing by again with our tour group arriving in the land of Israel. And Pete, if you can uh, let us in as to where you are today. Well, I'm in Tel Aviv, actually, in a place called Gordon's Beach. Uh, the city is just off to my side, and behind me is a nice little marina. A little bit uh, cloudy there, and uh, trust that no matter what the weather is, it's, it's always a good time to be in Israel. I know that you arrived there a few days ago, and you had opportunity to go up to Cyprus as well, but uh, what did you do yesterday? 
Well, yesterday I had a chance to go up to uh, Jerusalem and have lunch with the people we work with on the tour. We're all excited about the tour getting here. They leave the United States uh, on Wednesday, arrive Thursday, and uh, they tour around Caesarea and uh, Megiddo, uh, and then end up the night, Thursday night, in Tiberias. So looking forward to the group being here. Pete, I know you probably haven't been sitting around the hotel a whole lot, but have you had a chance to watch any Emmy TV? Well, I've had a wonderful chance to be able to watch Middle East television here in the hotel. Uh, it's really been inspiring to be able to have it on and see my dad's teaching program and uh, Joseph Prince and some of the other great ministries that are on Middle East television, as well as some good, clean, quality family programming. So, Pete, I hear that you finally took my advice. I hear you're on Twitter now. How do you plan to use it? Well, yes, Valerie, <laughs> I am now on Twitter. Uh, started last week chronicling what I'm doing, so people can go to Pete Sumbrall on Twitter, and uh, they can follow what we're doing in the, as far as the ministry goes, and especially as far as the, uh, the traveling and the tour and all that. So it's going to be a lot of fun to see uh, how that grows. Well, I'm sure you agree now. Twitter is a great way to communicate now, isn't it? I mean, it really gets the message out really fast. And how many characters, guys? 140. 140, 140. characters. Well, 241 million people are on Twitter, mm -hmm. so uh, it really is a, a, a great big universe out there. And, uh, uh, you know, it'll be fun to see how it all develops. Uh, Pete, a lot of developments in the Middle East. In fact, uh, we got to speak a little bit earlier about some things that are going on on the Egypt-Gaza border. But uh, when it comes to what we could do in prayer, how we should pray, what should we be praying for uh, for the friends and folks and really families, people there in Israel? Well, we really do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. There's a lot of news that out there right now that's not positive. Uh, I was in Jerusalem in September. I was uh, there in June, and uh, I was there th yesterday. And, uh, you know, it really is amazing how the news media blows so many things out of proportion. So there are challenges. There are troubles. Not trying to ignore that at all. And both sides are making uh, unbelievable comments. And uh, I, I think they, they all just really need to back off and not stop saying incendiary things. Uh, Israel has pledged to keep Temple Mount, uh, you know, as a status quo. Uh, but there's a lot of tension, a lot of, a lot of friction. And unfortunately, a lot of it goes back to back in June uh, when those three young uh, uh, Israeli Jewish boys were kidnapped and murdered. And that really set off a chain of events that uh, just has kind of escalated ever since. Well, are the people there concerned about not only their own safety, but the, the safety of people who come to visit? Well, really don't have any concerns about safety at all. Uh, been here many times during all kinds of situations and uh, really not challenged by it at all. Uh, you know, when I come, I usually rent a car or vehicle and drive myself around. And so uh, I've never had an experience of where I've been uh, challenged or concerned. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's parts of cities in the United States that I wouldn't go to, and there's parts of cities here in Israel that I wouldn't go to. And so you have to use wisdom and common sense and pray for God's protection. Pete, you know, I've often said that when we go to Israel, we get a chance to run where Jesus walked. Tell me, what's next for you, Pete? Well, I look forward to the group being here. <laughs> I look forward to being back with you again tomorrow on Harvest and uh, uh, really look forward to continuing to watch uh, Middle East television and enjoy it. And, uh, you know, just encourage people to pray for the election that's tomorrow in the United States, as well as pray for Israel, pray for the leadership of both the United States and Israel. And, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's so important that we do that, especially right now. Indeed, we will. And thanks so much for being with us today, Pete. Hey, thanks. Great to be with you. We'll be back again tomorrow. Wonderful. Pete Summerall there. We're going to be uh, catching up with him all this week. And I don't think I've seen that kind of cloudy, foggy Never. image there in that marina uh, where he's at in Tel Aviv. But mm -hmm. uh, the weather changes pretty quickly. So I'm sure it's going to be a good week for the, the it, tour group. It does change quickly. But I want to ask a quick question. Have you noticed what I'm noticing? There's a lot less of you or less <laughs> of you. I wouldn't say a lot less yeah, of you. What are you less. doing? Uh, I basically cut out uh, uh, refined flour products. Okay. Cut out sugar completely. I haven't had any sugar other than that wonderful birthday cake yes. uh, a week or so ago <laughs> uh, for about four months now. And so it's just, you know, trimming right down. Okay. Yeah, well, we don't need that stuff. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to cut out that flour. I'm going to cut out the sugar. Sugar, yeah, the rice and potatoes. <laughs> Go with sweet potatoes instead of regular potatoes. Okay. Much better for hey, uh, real quickly, um, uh, I know we've just got a second here, but Pete mentioned this morning while we were on it, we had a conference call at O Dark 30, 
that uh, on the Egypt-Gaza border, that Egypt was de de demolishing, moving people out of homes and demolishing homes to create a buffer zone to kind of fortify their border with Gaza. Have you heard any of that news? Had not, but uh, perhaps Brian Bush can update us on that a little bit later on, right after Wonderful. the international news. All right, great. Well, we're going to move on to our international news here on The Harvest Show. We'd love to know your thoughts as well. You can share them with us on Facebook, Twitter. You can send your emails directly to the set of Harvest. Live at LaCie.com is that address. And the international news is next with Chuck Freeby. Now on this Monday, the third day of November in 2014, here's what's happening in your world. Baghdad residents once again find themselves cleaning up, this time after a Sunday night car bomb attack. A car bomb targeting Shiite pilgrims detonated last night, killing 14 people and wounding 31 others. The blast occurred near tents serving Shiite pilgrims on their way to Karbala to commemorate the religious holiday of Ashura. Ashura commemorates the 7th century death of Imam Hussein. He's a grandson of Prophet Muhammad and an iconic martyr among Shiite Muslims. Sunni insurgents frequently target Shiites because they consider them heretics. Bangladesh's Supreme Court today upheld the death sentence given to a senior Islamist leader convicted last year for his role in mass killings during the country's 1971 independence war against Pakistan. The decision means that 62-year-old Mohammad Kamaruzaman, an assistant secretary general of Bangladesh's largest Islamist political party, will face hanging within months. He would be just the second person put to death since tribunals were set up four years ago to try suspected war criminals. Bangladesh blames Pakistani soldiers and local collaborators for the deaths of 3 million people during the nine-month 1971 war. An estimated 200,000 women were raped. About 10 million people were forced to take shelter in refugee camps in neighboring India. Investigators looking into what caused Friday's crash of a Virgin Galactic prototype spacecraft that killed one of two test pilots say a device meant to slow the craft's descent prematurely deployed. National Transportation Safety Board Chairman Christopher Hart said investigators found the feathering system was activated before the craft reached an appropriate speed for that device. Normal launch procedures are that after the, the release, the ignition of the rocket and acceleration, that the, feather, the, the feathering devices are not to be moved, the unlock the lock-unlock lever is not to be moved into the unlock position until the acceleration up to Mach 1.4. Instead, as I indicated, that occurred approximately Mach 1.0. The wreckage was dispersed over a five-mile radius of the Mojave Desert in California. The pilot killed in the test flight was identified as Michael Alsbury of nearby Tehacopi. The surviving pilot is Peter Siebold, who parachuted to safety and is hospitalized. British royal couple Prince Charles and his wife, the Duchess of Cornwall, arrived in Mexico Sunday, part of a four-day visit to that country. They headed straight for the town of Real de Monte in the state of Hidalgo. The town has had a strong bond with the UK since the 19th century after Cornish miners settled there. The royal couple visited the British cemetery and laid a wreath on the grave of the only British soldier to be buried in Mexico. He fought in the First World War. Along with Prince Charles, the governor of Hidalgo visited a shrine of the Day of the Dead celebrations, which take place between October 31st and November 2nd. And this is not the most important story, but it's the one everybody's talking about today. Daredevil Nick Walunda wild Chicago and the world Sunday with two hair-raising skyscraper crossings on high wires without a safety net or a harness, one of which he performed blindfolded. Thousands of cheering fans packed the streets around the city's Marina City Towers to watch the 35-year-old heir to the flying Walenda's family business complete the back-to-back -back walks. Wearing that bright red jacket, Walenda prayed constantly as he took about six and a half minutes to walk the 454-foot stretch from the Marina City West Tower to the top of a building on the other side of the river. Walenda broke two world records for his high-wire performances, one for the highest incline tightrope walk and for the highest blindfolded tightrope walk. A man who 
walks a verbal tightrope every time he joins us. Brian Bush joins us now from Jerusalem. But seriously, Brian, as our Lassie correspondent based there in Jerusalem, give us an update on the situation there over the weekend. Well, hi, Chuck. Yeah, the situation uh, over the weekend markedly was reduced. And uh, today it's pretty much everything's back to normal. The police barricades and barriers have been removed. Uh, there's no observation blimps in the air, no helicopters. Uh, there's been a serious reduction in the number of paramilitary forces that are around. There are still areas where there are uh, heavy police presence, etc. But, uh, you know, it really got to a tipping point. Uh, it was the worst that I had seen it uh, since the Second Intifada about 10 years ago. Uh, thankfully, there hasn't been uh, the type of loss of life that there was back then. But uh, the situation seriously has become much, much better. That after a clandestine meeting that apparently took place between Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the King of Jordan, King Abdullah, in Amman on Saturday night. Chuck? What more do we know about this alleged meeting between the King of Jordan and Israel's Prime Minister? Well, uh, not much is known about the meeting. A Kuwaiti newspaper is reporting it, and this paper has had a reputable uh, past track record. So uh, there's reason to believe that this might actually have happened. Uh, the reason that we can say that it probably did happen is because, they, uh, of, because of what happened after uh, Saturday night. You know, there was Mr. Netanyahu's statement uh, during an urgent Israeli parliamentarian uh, uh, meeting of his cabinet, he said to basically cool things down. Don't flame the fans of antagonists or extremists. And he asked the members of his Knesset to take responsible measures uh, in, in their approach towards visiting the Temple Mount. Now, that's because over the last seven or eight days, we've had high-profile members of the Knesset and other public Jewish figures, activists, trying to visit and visiting, for a fact, the Temple Mount. And when they have, it's further raised the flames and the rhetoric amongst Palestinians, and that uh, overflows into the streets, and then we have the bad news that we've been seeing. So he took that measure on Saturday night. Following him was Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who made a public comment thanking the Israeli Prime Minister for taking steps to calm the situation here in Jerusalem, most specifically on the Haram el-Sharif, the Temple Mount. Chuck? Break down the situation for us, Brian. What is the basic problem for Jews in visiting the Temple Mount? Well, Chuck, there, there is no basic problem. They can visit the Temple Mount. Um, the problem in their perception and uh, that's garnering this, this public drive is that they're not allowed to carry out organized prayer or worship. And so activists, extremists, they want to get up there and they want to do that because they want to push their point forward. And then the, the Palestinians perceive that as an attempt to change the status quo, to exercise uh, religious rights up on the Haram al-Sharif or the Temple Mount, and that's where you've got a problem. And they're, the Palestinians are not without precedent on this issue because you'll remember a few years ago at the El Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, there was a Jewish extremist who went up there. I think he killed 39 Muslim worshipers at the time. And then the Israeli authorities unilaterally divided that mosque into a Jewish area and a Muslim area. Now, up until that time, it was one functioning area under the control of the Waqf, which is the Islamic Trust. And so Muslims are paranoid, worried that the Waqf would be forced into another such arrangement, which ultimately could lead to some type of a Jewish temple being built there in time to come. So they're not willing to compromise the integrity of Islam's third holiest site. So that's the, that's the nutshell of the issue. Chuck? Okay, Brian, in just two days' time, our Lucie Tour group is coming over there to the Holy Land. I see you're in a jacket today. Any last words of advice and what to pack for that group? 
Well, the first thing I would say is, folks, you're going to have the trip of a lifetime. You really are. This is the land of the Bible. Um, you're going to see and learn so much. Um, I wouldn't be worried about uh, the, the perception of violence here in Jerusalem. Again, as I've said, it's, it's calmed down. Uh, as far as the weather is concerned, you can see that we've got uh, some stormy clouds. We've had rain this morning. We had hail up in Haifa for five minutes. Pretty good-sized hail, meatball-sized hail. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, but you can hear, you know, people are celebrating uh, their bar mitzvahs here uh, just off to the side. Um, you know, people, life in Jerusalem is normal, and you're going to have a great time. The weather is due to be sunny, uh, so you will want to bring a jacket with you uh, because it does get cool here in Jerusalem in the evenings. But friends, come. You're going to have a wonderful, wonderful trip. Chuck? All right. All right, Brian. Yes, we can hear those bar mitzvahs in the background. Thank you for your report. Stefan had asked during the opening chat about the Egypt-Gaza buffer zone they are doing some work there to try to set up a buffer zone for weapon smuggling. And you can see here in the last few minutes an AP report that an explosive device went off today near Egyptian troops demolishing houses in a town on the border with the Gaza Strip where Egypt is clearing a buffer zone to halt weapon smuggling. No casualties in that blast. There is a raised security alert level now and no group has taken responsibility yet for that explosion. We'll keep you updated on what's going on over there. Still to come on Harvest, it's true that focusing on Christian do's and don'ts can lead to a life of legalism. At least that's the thought of Pastor Jamie Snyder, who answers that question for us a little later up. But now, author and lawyer Tammy Weiser shares strategies for engaging God's Word and transforming your life. The Harvest Show continues after this. Prayer has the power to overcome anything this world throws at you. Dr. Sumrall's book, Secrets of Answered Prayer, outlines steps you can take to ensure a prayer life that brings about results. Secrets of Answered Prayer is our gift to thank you for your donation to help LaSea Broadcasting continue bringing God's light to our dark and desperate world. So pick up the phone and call right now to LaSea Broadcasting. Request your copy of the book from Dr. Lester Sumrall's Secrets to Answered Prayer when you give your gift. And thank you for helping broadcast the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here at Prayer Line, we devote ourselves to prayer. 24 hours a day, we are on watch and thankful for every call that we receive. We see each caller not only as a prayer partner, but another opportunity to see God move and lives changed. If you have a need, please call us at 1-800-365-3732. Are you one of the millions of people who invest in the stock market? And maybe you're one of the fortunate ones whose stock has grown in value, or like a lot of others, it has lost value since you bought it. We all need wisdom during this up and down economy, and there are ways to get some relief from the roller coaster ride on Wall Street. If you use that stock to make a gift to LaSea Broadcasting, you can help yourself at the same time. You can avoid capital gains tax if your stock has increased in value, or just cut your losses, sell the stock, give the proceeds, and get a big tax write-off and get that losing stock to pay you back. Giving stock at year-end is a great way to save on your taxes, but you must do it now, before December 31st. Invest in saving lives instead. Call us at 1-800-365-3732 to get all your questions answered. Giving stock. It's the tax-wise thing to do. As the former executive vice president and in-house counsel for Back to the Bible International Ministry, author Tammy Weisert knows what it takes to activate God's word in your life. She says Bible reading doesn't have to be boring. And she joins us with a message from her, from her new project, 
off the page and into your life. And welcome to The Harvest Show. Thank you for having me. Okay, so like you have this amazing career. We're going to talk about uh, your new project, but take us back to the Bible. I mean, how many times have you heard it, yes, Stephan? Mm -hmm. I, I think everybody has kind of grown up with Back to the Bible. Mm -hmm. What were your responsibilities there? Well, I've been there, had been there for 15 years, mm -hmm. just transitioning out of that ministry, executive vice president, in-house counsel. But the thing that grew me the most there was being the co-host of the Back to the Bible radio program for almost nine years, and that just ended in May of this year, mm -hmm. and sitting with the teaching of Dr. Woodrow Kroll initially, and then just at the end with Dr. John Monroe, learned so much. It changed, changed the way I engaged God's Word and really laid the foundation for this book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hear you using that word, engage yes. God's Word. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> it really is a three-step process. You think about reading God's Word, and that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But it is receiving, which can be reading or listening to God's Word, then moving it down here to reflecting, which is considering what, what you've read, what you've taken in, and then responding to it. So receive, reflect, respond, kind of a, a process to really get it off the page and right working through your life. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me back up a little bit. Before you became the co-host and really started, I, I would imagine that that position prompted you to really want mm -hmm. to engage God's Word. Mm -hmm. What was your walk like before <laughs> then? That's the question. Well, uh, not, not great. Mm -hmm. um, my story is part of this book. I was saved when I was eight years old, loved the Lord, was in church all the time, but what I missed, I did not understand the importance of being in God's Word myself mm -hmm. outside of church. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that while I was growing up, and that proved detrimental to me. When I got out of my parents' home and into college, really went my own way for quite a few years. Not an intentional turning my back on God so much, but it happened, and before I knew it, my husband and I were pursuing material things, you know, new mm -hmm. house, new car, nice jobs. God allowed that for a while and then got my attention through uh, anxiety. That's, in, that's part of the story. And through that, coming back to church, slowly starting to connect those dots, I need to be in God's Word for myself. And then when I got to back to the Bible in 2000, having that message in front of me, witnessing it, experiencing it, little by little, I started engaging daily. And then when I became part of the radio program, boy, I was in taking and teaching all the time, and it transformed my life. Mm. Now, when it comes to engaging God's Word, uh, whether it's, uh, you did it on somewhat of a professional basis, if we, if I could put it that way, you know, in a ministry mm -hmm. basis, right. in a ministry setting, right. uh, uh, and uh, not saying that that was your, you did it because it was responsibility, your duty, your, for your, your position, your job or anything, but uh, how do you keep fresh? How do you personally, Tammy, kind mm -hmm. of stay engaged and stay mm -hmm. fresh with the Word of God? I do a daily scripture blog that started about five or six years ago. When I was asked to do that, I very quickly said, oh, sure, thinking that would be a, a light commitment, and yeah. that's seven days a week. Mm -hmm. wow. So I use that as my start of the day every day because I'm writing a blog that is about scripture, asking people to engage God's word with me four mm -hmm. or more times a week. Please do this, and it's an it's interactive thing. a lot of thing. writing. It's, they're short because mm -hmm. people don't, as you know, they want have a lot of time. Size, they right? want bite size, and right. so that's a short thing. I start there. Um, I try to read other than that and, and study God's Word, mm -hmm. always asking questions. I, I have a unique method called take it in and live it out. That's what I call it. Mm -hmm. So reading God's Word and saying, show me what you have. What does that look like? And do I, do I respond like that person? Or am I behaving like that person? And why? Mm -hmm. And asking a lot of questions. So in above the, the blog writing that I'm in the Word as well, uh, reading and writing and it's just a process. And then on my cell phone every day, I'm getting little yeah. little things. Yeah. So there's yeah. lots of ac activity with God's Word throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Tammy, I'm going to say for people who are embarrassed to say, I think it's the dirty little secret for some Christians, they think that reading the Bible is boring, yep. especially new beginners, uh, you know, people who are just coming to the faith. And they think Bible reading mm -hmm. is boring. What really say certain you? certain parts. You know? Yeah, certain yeah, parts, yeah. especially when you're reading through the King James Version, the Old <laughs> Testament, thou, those, you know, you have all of this language and then you go over to Revelation and it's symbolism and you mm -hmm. don't understand mm -hmm. it. What do you say to that person to jumpstart getting the Word of God off the page and into their lives? Well, I used to be that way. Okay. And, and let me say, part of that, and I'm speaking for myself, I would use that as an excuse not to stay into God's Word. I, I, it was boring. It was this or that. Well, there's not a one-size-fits-all way to take in God's Word. Okay. And once I finally discovered that, because I always had in my head that there was a particular way that it would be something like what my pastor was doing on Sunday, and I couldn't possibly, you know, recreate that, so I would allow myself to say, well, then I'm excused. Hmm. But when I realize we all have different 
uh, likes and dislikes and, and learning styles. Uh, if you start getting into God's Word and use a method that resonates with your learning style, it mm -hmm. is much more enjoyable to come back. So when I'm talking about asking the questions and, and looking at, I'm a real creative and learner, it's kind of my thing. So that's the way I like to engage. And once I started engaging in that manner, instead of just reading and putting it down and saying, well, I could never, you know, I don't have a theology degree or I don't have this or I don't have that. And so I allow that to let me put it down. It changed everything. And God's word is active and living sharper than any two-edged sword. If you're in it, even a little bit, and you are consistently mm -hmm. in it, that desire will continue to grow. You're not going to know everything either. I mean, you mm -hmm. talked about the, the language and, and the symbolism. No one will ever be able to say with absolute surety, I know everything about God's word. Every time you go back to it, he reveals a little more. Mm -hmm. So if you pray before, ask God to reveal just one thing, one new thing to you, you know, and then you can use that for the day, then you're encouraged to come back yeah. and do it again. When we look at uh, off the page and into your life, you've kind of uh, painted the picture of, of seven ladies, or told seven mm -hmm. stories. Yeah of different ladies. Uh, where did that idea come from to kind of encapsulate your message in the, the, the true life stories of others that you've met? I was encouraged to write a book a few years ago and I thought, who would want, why should I write a book? And, and people were saying, well, tell your story, tell your story. And I, so that's how the idea started. And then I thought, well, my stories, that's not enough to fill a book. So I started talking to other women. I speak to women's groups and, and I hear stories and I thought, well, wow, I should start looking yeah. at some of these different stories and then find some different ways to engage the word so that I can help ladies find that way, mm -hmm. that way that resonates with them. With them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So while I have seven stories in the book, each story, each lady has a different story, but they also have a different way to engage the word. So mm -hmm. you're going to be introduced to a number of different ways to sample and to try to get into word that way. And then as you finish the book, hopefully you will have found at least one way that really resonates with you, that really gets you excited to either supplement what you're already doing or maybe it's a new way. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more exciting than what you're doing and a, and a better way to engage God's Good. Word. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about those stories when we return with Tammy Weisert. She's the author of Off the Page and Into Your Life. Harvest continues. Partners, David had them when he built the temple and Jesus needed them to complete his mission on earth. The C Broadcasting still needs partners today. When you join Partners in Faith, you are part of God's legacy of partnership. God is not willing for even one soul to be lost, and He depends on partners like you and me. Be a partner in faith. Reach the lost with Jesus. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Call today. Are you tired yet have trouble sleeping? Wired yet can't focus? Let's face it, you only get one life. It's time to start living. It's time for a new you. Introducing the new you pack from Making Healthy Choices. This incredible package includes vitamin B12 with folic acid to promote focus and support cardiovascular health, vitamin D3 to build strong bones and muscles, vitamin E400, an all natural antioxidant and mineral concentrate a fulvic acid trace mineral product essential for maximum cell function and performance. This exclusive offer is yours for the low price of $49.95 plus shipping and handling. You won't find these products in stores only by calling 1-800-965-2345 or by logging on to mhclife.com. It's time for a new you. It's time for life. Uh, I'm sitting here today with Peace. Peace is about 17 years old. He's lived here for seven years. He came here after his family was killed. His mom and dad were killed during one of the Civil Wars. And um, he lost his mom and dad, but he was brought here by a relative along with his two brothers and a sister. So there's four from one family living here. And um, this is where they live. This is where they go to school. This is, uh, this is home. Yeah, I asked Peace if uh, before he came here, did he go to church? Had he heard about Jesus? He said, no, I never heard of Jesus till I came here. So this orphanage is a place where these children are being fed every day. They're getting sustenance for their body. They're getting food. They're also getting the Word of God. Man does not live by bread alone. And for us to feed the hungry, we're serious about that. We got to feed these kids. We got to take care of them so they'll have a future. But we also got to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And both things are happening here at this place.
And we are back with author Tommy, T excuse me, Tammy Weissert. She's the author of Off the Page and Into Your Life. No, she is not a man. Her name is not Tommy. Her <laughs> name is Tammy. Thank you so much, Tammy, uh, for joining us and for allowing me to slip up a little bit and giving me grace. I'll answer to anything. I'm oh, telling okay. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before we went to break, you were talking about the different learning styles and mm -hmm. how you have different women telling stories. And I was sharing with you during the break, I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. Yeah. I have to touch. I have to see oh. and feel. And that's how I can learn the Bible. Talk about some of the different learning styles represented by these women. Mm. Well, funny, mine, of course, I've already talked about, take it in, live it out. Mm -hmm. I use the actual, I love to be in the word flipping the pages, but I also am electronic, so I go back and forth. Um, the second chapter of the book, Carly's story, as I was interviewing Carly, she started talking about prayer journaling is what she called it. Now, I'm just going to say, I am not really a fond Journaler. I like to, I'm not fond of journaling. Mm -hmm. So as she was telling me the story, I was trying not to show a face because I have committed to doing each method first before I ask the reader to do it, and then you get to see my experience. So I was thinking, oh, no. <laughs> you know, here we go. I'm going to have to journal. But I have to say it was nothing like I had uh, conceived in my mind. I, I, you know, I have preconceived notions about it. So when I got into do Carly's method of prayer journaling, mm -hmm. I even had it like planted in my head. I'm like, I know how this is going to go. I had had this little talk, you know, planned it all out, and I was like, ah, it's going to be boring. It was the most incredible method ever, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, I use that sometimes now to supplement what I'm doing because it was nothing like I thought. Mm -hmm. So it is a type of journaling, but also just talking with God and writing out your prayers. That one was amazing. There are uh, a woman that does some memorization, and there's a use of note cards. There's a repetitive um, method in there where you strongly focus on your choice whether you take a verse or a passage or a, a chapter and just stay there stay there and each day going back saying God show me something different and mm -hmm. he will he absolutely does mm -hmm. uh, writing out scripture verbalizing scripture there are many little different subtleties of ways to take in God's word throughout the different different methods and some of those are combined and others are are just straight up doing that for, for mm. a week wow so you actually made the commitment to uh employer or practice I for did. one month each of these different ladies uh, methods uh -huh. i didn't do a whole month yeah that's uh -huh. taken me a long, <laughs> a long time but i did try each one and yeah. then at the end of the chapter you get to see my experience because yeah. i want i don't want to ask someone to do something that i haven't done myself right. Right. so i committed to trying each method and you get a candid and i do mean candid there are certain things i didn't care for as much as others and i mm -hmm. say that in there mm -hmm. this maybe wasn't my favorite thing to do but here's what i learned from it mm -hmm. uh, or this one really resonated with me i loved it now it's your turn mm -hmm. okay. so each chapter each, uh, tells a different story different mm -hmm. woman's story different woman's uh, approach to engaging the bible uh, what's your goal for for each of those chapters why did you include them my goal is to help women get consistently in God's Word mm -hmm. because nothing is going to change your life more than being in God's Word consistently four or more times a week. When I was at Back to the Bible, mm -hmm. they have a research division mm -hmm. and they have surveyed over 150,000 people wow. trying to figure out why so many people, Christian people, mm -hmm. own Bibles yet they don't open them. There's a, there's a disconnect. You can see it all through society. Mm -hmm. So that started about 10 years ago and out of that research, we were letting people write in answers and we were layering in what came out of that is people that were in the Word four or more times a week led dramatically different lifestyles than people mm -hmm. that were in even three times a week. And wow. most mm -hmm. Christians were telling us they were in zero to one times a week and that one was church attendance. Yeah. So not a lot of Bible engagement going Outside, on, but the people yeah. that were in the Word yeah. four or more, wow. Their lifestyle is less likely to be engaged in sex outside of marriage, less likely to mm -hmm. be addicted to drugs and alcohol, less likely to gamble, less likely to be addicted to pornography, more content, things that you would desire as a Christian. So the goal of this book is to show people mm. the power of God's Word, get them loving it and getting them engaging with God's Word four or more times a week so they can experience the same life change that I've experienced and that each one of these ladies experienced. You know, Tammy, the Bible tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight, and so getting into the Word of God, you know, sometimes we want to make sure we're going to get a benefit from it. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, according to the Word, that if you do read the Bible, that you will get a benefit. Absolutely. And, and it's not because we're saying it, it's because God made this promise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, God's promise and what we have seen when, when Back to the Bible did the research over and over again, that is exactly what people are telling us. Mm -hmm. This is the benefit. 
not that you go in saying, well, this is my goal right. for reading God's Word. God's going to grow you and change your lifestyle. And I can say that from my own experience. I didn't even realize it was happening. But if I look back even a couple of years ago to where I am today, I can't imagine. You know, I look back and see how God has grown me. Ten, year, ten years ago back to today, mm -hmm. huge change in my lifestyle. I don't even realize it. And I'm thankful as I look back and realize just being in the Word, mm -hmm. the difference it's made. Wow. Okay, so... Okay, go on. Sorry. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all these experiences, all these test runs and these mm -hmm. different methods, was there one that really stood out and uh, created maybe the most surprise or the most uh, enjoyable experience for you? I, I really think the, the second chapter, Carly's, was the most enjoyable for me. I had tried some of the other methods mm -hmm. in here and enjoyed them and used them once in a while as well. But because I was so sure that I was not, I mean, I really had made up my mind, I was not going to enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Journaling, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really wasn't journaling like right. I had in my mind at all. It was writing something down, but it wasn't what I had in my head. It was, it was an excellent exercise for me at the time I did it. God really revealed to me some convicted me pretty good as I mm -hmm. went through and did that lesson <laughs> as I was preparing for the book. So uh, that was probably my favorite method. Good. Wow, thanks so much for sharing with us. And now you know what to do to get the <laughs> Word of God off the page and into your life. And so do I. To connect with Tammy, go to poweredby4.org or go to harvest-tv.com and click on show info in the menu bar for a link to her new project off the page and into your life. And still to come, Pastor Charles joins us with today's prayer request. But up next, can focusing on Christian do's and don'ts lead to a life of legalism? Pastor Jamie Snyder weighs in when Harvest returns. Many Christian ministries have desired to bring the gospel of Jesus to Israel, to proclaim his message of God's love to the villages and streets he walked while on this earth. Yet only one Christian network has been broadcasting the message of God's love to Israel for more than 10 years. By God's grace, Lassie Broadcasting has been bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the voices of many American ministries to every home in Israel via Middle East television. You can help this great work by becoming a partner in faith for as little as $25 a month. Call today. Author and pastor Jamie Snyder is on a mission to disprove the perception that God's favorite words are, thou shall not. He joins us today to talk about his new project. Hello, pastor, and welcome to The Harvest Show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Pastor Jamie, I remember when I was a teenager saying, I don't want to get saved because they're always telling me what I cannot do. I'd imagine as a pastor, you often hear that as well. That's exactly it. And honestly, that was my story growing up as well. You know, I grew up in a great church and I'm thankful for the foundation of God. But my uh, most memories are the things I knew I wasn't supposed to do. And once I did, I, I felt sort of lost in life at that point in time. So uh, people definitely have that perception of God that the first words are going to roll off his tongue is thou shalt not. Pastor Snyder, you know, you talk about in your project, you talk about how Christians try to avoid certain uh, wrongdoings or certain sins. And if they can just not do those things, then they'll be OK. They'll have this perfect relationship relationship address that that point. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, and there certainly are commands and instructions God has given us. But what I talk about in, in this book, this project, is that uh, those are parameters so that we can live and live well. You know, um, just thinking that we can live a passive life of sin avoidance and then God's going to stand up on his throne and clap his hands, uh, we'll be remiss. You know, he, he has sent us on a mission. He has a purpose for us. It is a very active life he has called us to. He's an active God. And so the life he's called us to is a reflection of who he is and what he does. And, and so there's certainly some thou shall nots to follow but those are so that we can stay in motion and on mission. You mm -hmm. know, just, just being passive and expecting to honor God is, is not going to end up doing so. Well, there's this huge debate that's going on in Christendom about the message of grace and how people are making it kind of greasy grace because you can just sin and do what you want to do. Do you kind of address that issue as well? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I, I speak about the very seriousness of sin. I, I say in there that sin is that serious literally. You know, Jesus died on the cross because sin was that serious. You know, and the, the Apostle Paul brings up that same argument in his letter to the Romans. He says, what, should we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Mm -hmm. He said, of course not. Uh, of course we shouldn't. We, we should not sin anymore. You know, God's grace is not an excuse to keep sinning. God's grace is the only reason we need to stop sinning. We don't live under the power of sin anymore. And so this is certainly not about treating sin flippantly or uh, just saying, well, we can just live however we want because God is good and we're saved. No, 
uh, sin is serious, and that's why he wants to protect us from it. He doesn't want to oppress us. He wants to, us to live and live free. Okay, you say that one word can change everything. What's that one word, and how does it change us? Yeah, that, that one word is not. You know, if you believe God is a thou shall not God, then you are likely going to settle for a passive uh, life of sin avoidance, thinking you're going to honor God. But when you come to the realization that God is indeed a thou shall God, that he has called us to move and act and serve and love and share and go, it, it changes everything. It's a radical paradigm shift that shifts everything about our understanding of him. And our understanding of him has everything to do with how we're then going to live out the faith he has called us to. And so when you believe that God is a God that is very quick to say, hey, thou shall uh, do these things mm -hmm. uh, as an intention to live a holy life, it'll change everything about how you live. It's, it's not as safe as life. It's just not doing things, but it's a life that honors God. Well, when you write about a message like this or preach about it, um, I'd imagine you have to walk through it yourself. So what was the hardest part about this message and what was the most satisfying? Yeah, you know, it, it was it was very satisfying to, to do some of this study and be reminded that, uh, you know, I have a God that's not content for me just to sit on my hand and uh, um, develop a resume of things I haven't done. No, I, I have a God that when I get there, when I get to meet him and when he says, well done, my good and faithful servant, it is going to be far more about the things I did in his name and the people I loved in his name than the certain behaviors I didn't do because I say I love him. Yeah. Those things certainly matter as well. But, you know, th this has been really a life journey more than just a, a, a very temporary journey, transitioning from a thou shalt not God to a thou shalt God. You know, I spent uh, the first 20 years of my life believing in a thou shalt not God and lived a certain kind of faith because of that. And now um, I'm trying to learn and understand this thou shall God and uh, live an active life in motion and on mission, a life that he has called me to live, bringing his will here on earth just as it is being carried out in heaven. And isn't it empowering when we focus on the things that God says we can do when we, I mean, we definitely should avoid sin. We definitely should uh, not do certain things. But when we focus on the things that God has called us to, that's empowering. It opens up a brand new world for us, and we are able to help other people, aren't we? No, yeah, absolutely. And the opportunities abound, they're endless. And, and I believe that when we're living on mission, the mission he's called us to, you're never going to feel feel nearer to the heart of God than, than right in those moments. I mean, it's like he's behind this thin veil when you are living and caring for the oppressed and you are advocating for the marginalized of society, when you are going and sharing the good news of Jesus and being the good news of Jesus, you're going to feel the closest to him than you ever could. If you just settle for a passive life of sin avoidance, likely God's going to seem distant because he's busy carrying out a mission here on earth as it is in heaven. Pastor, what would you like the readers and viewers to walk away with when they read this, um, the message, thou shall not, freedom to strip away the knots and discover what God really wants? What's the takeaway? You know, the biggest thing I want them to do is, is what all of us need to do occasionally is just do a, an honest evaluation of who we believe God to be. And, and what did we base that understanding on? Was that just passed down to us from someone who passed it on to them who passed it on to them? Because our understanding of God will, more than anything, it'll shape who we are and how we live. It'll shape how we treat everyone else around us because we believe God treats us that same way. So it is just critical and crucial that we don't just assume that we understand completely who God is and what he's like, but we, we let the scripture say who he is and what he's like and, and do some radical changes to our life if necessary letting him be who he says he is, not just who we want him to be. And I'm going to say amen to that. Thank you so much, Pastor Jamie Snyder, for joining us here today on The Harvest Show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And to connect with Pastor Snyder, go to lakeside.org. That's lakeside.org. Or go to harvest-tv.com for a link to his new project, Thou Shall Not. Harvest will continue in just a moment. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Do you have some treasures like silver and gold coins or old jewelry that you don't wear anymore? Why not invest them into changing lives for Jesus? Ask yourself if these treasures are really worth keeping, or should you invest them into making an eternal difference in someone's life? Call 1-800-365-3732 for a prepaid insured shipping envelope. Lay up your treasure in heaven. It'll be waiting for you when you get there. Critical news is happening in the Middle East 24-7, and I am living in the middle of it all, right here in Jerusalem. Correspondent Brian Bush brings you a front row seat to major events unfolding in the Middle East. Brian knows the people and the land, keeping you abreast of the news with expert analysis from a Christian perspective. 
Watch by Israel up to the minute reports on the Harvest Show right here, only on this Lissy Broadcasting Station. Did you know that millions live in spiritual darkness seeking the Word of God? Lissy Broadcasting is piercing the darkness 24 hours a day. The window of opportunity to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been greater, but who knows when it will close. Join Partners in Faith today for as little as $25 a month, and you can help us bring light into a dark world. Join us by visiting PartnerInFaith.com today. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge and my saviour. From violent people you save me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Want to accept Jesus as your personal saviour or have questions about Christian life? Call Prayer Line at 1-800-365-3732. Every year we have an incredible opportunity to be able to go to Israel and take prayer requests to the Western Wall. And you may be wondering, what is the Western Wall? Thousands of years ago when the temple was built on Temple Mount in Jerusalem, they had to build a retaining wall on the west side of Temple Mount. Well, that is the Western Wall, and it's now called the Wailing Wall. And if you go down deep enough, you can actually find the foundations of the original temple that was built up on Temple Mount. Over the years, a lot of people have made a journey to the Western Wall, also called the Wailing Wall, where they can pray at the wall. And it's believed, there's no proof, that possibly the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments is somewhere on the other side of that wall. We go there every year to pray. It really is a very spiritual place. Thousands of people have been there have literally almost every day. Sometimes millions go during the course of the year. It really is a very special place and a very special time. And I have the opportunity to be able to take prayer requests from the names of our partners there every single year. I take them on an electronic disc so that I can just place it up against the wall and pray. But a lot of people take those prayer requests and put them in the cracks of the wall. And several times a year, those prayer requests are removed out of those cracks in the wall by rabbis. They're taken over to the Mount of Olives and buried on the Mount of Olives so that they can continue to pray for those prayer requests because they believe too the Messiah will come one day to the Mount of Olives where those prayer requests are. I'm going to the wall in November and I want to take your prayer requests with me. We've had the opportunity to be able to take thousands and thousands of prayer requests with us over the last few years. And once again, we're going to be doing that in November. And we want to take your prayer request. I want you to go to the phone right now, 1-800-365-3732, or go to the website, lacy.com and send us your prayer request. And be sure to watch the Harvest Show's live program, November 11th, where you will see how I personally took your request and prayed over them at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. I look forward to praying for your needs. Call or email today. And that is actually coming up next Tuesday, November 11th. Pete Summerall will be taking your prayer requests with him to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, taking time to pray. And if you have prayer requests that you'd like for him to take over, you can send them to us now by email prayer at lacy.com. I don't think you're going to be able to get them here in the mail in time for us to then fax or copy and forward over. So email is the best way to go. So if there's something that's been on your heart heavy, maybe it's a prayer request that's been unanswered for some time and you just like some extra prayer, we'd love to uh, send those over to Pete Summerall so that he can bring them to the Western Wall in time. Again, next Tuesday, November 11th is that day. Right now, though, let's go to our prayer line center right now. Pastor Charles, who's standing by. And Pastor Charles, uh, what do you have for us today? Some prayer requests, some praise reports? Yeah, 
Hey, hey, we have plenty of requests. We have plenty of uh, praise reports as well. You know, as a matter of fact, we got a call from one of the callers, uh, Stephan, who asked us a question. We said, well, we're actually a prayer line. We don't do a lot of question answering, but go ahead anyway. He goes, well, what are you taking the prayer request over to the wall for? Christians don't pray at that wall. <laughs> I said, well, you know, first and <laughs> foremost, the one who's taking them is definitely a Christian. And then uh, I have a question for you. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Jesus said man is to always pray, right? Yeah. We have some prayer requests here. We've got one from Maggie in Tennessee, Stephan. She says, I have been involved in an ungodly relationship and I need God to help me out of it. She says, please agree with me in prayer that he'll do just that. And then we have Don in Wisconsin says, you know, I thought it and now I know my wife is in a relationship outside of our marriage. And he says, please pray with me that I do the right thing. Then we have Carla in Louisiana says, I am in great need to be delivered. I was a sex slave and I know God is the only one that can do it. And then last but not least, we have India who's also down in Louisiana says, my husband needs a healing in his body. She says he has problems with both his liver and his kidney. She says, as a matter of fact, he needs a miracle. Mm. Well, Pastor Charles, if you could uh, lead us in prayer today, we've got just a couple minutes, uh, whether it's relationships, addictions, uh, physical healing issues, we know that God is able yes, to answer is. those prayers. Yes, he is. Father in heaven, we thank you today. And it's just like Stephen said, Lord God, we know that you're able. Those ones who are calling, Lord God, those are the ones who are emailing and writing us, Father, they too know that you're able. They're calling us, Lord God, to be in agreement with them as we come to you with their requests. And we're asking you today to move upon them, Lord, like never before. Let them know that you're the one who did it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Charles. Our phone number there, as you see on the screen, often on The Harvest Show, 1-800-365-3732. That's the way you can connect with Prayer Line. You can also email prayer at lacy.com, and our volunteers will get that prayer request, take some time to read through it, pray through it, and then send you a response back as well. I want to encourage you, if you uh, write in or if you email in, send us a photo as well. We'd love to put that photo up in our chapel upstairs. Uh, we call it the Wall of Love. It's now actually several walls of love, and it's a place where uh, our volunteers go, our staff go from time to time to take a moment, prepare for their time on prayer line, or just to pray in general. Uh, with those photos there, it's a great way for us to connect with you and um, just to pray as the, the, the Spirit of God would lead. Well, thank you for joining us here on Harvest today. Love to see you tomorrow. And don't forget, send in your prayer requests. We want to take them to Israel to the Western Wall next Tuesday. If you love God, but your faith needs refueling, be refreshed with The Harvest Show. Harvest is real and relevant with God-loving people ready to help reignite your faith with prayer, inspiring guest interviews, and great conversation about the goodness of God. Build up your spirit and your mind with international news from a Christian perspective and live reports from Israel. The Harvest Show is hosted by a team of Christians who love God and work hard to extend His love to you. When your faith needs to be renewed, watch The Harvest Show live Monday through Friday on the LaCie Broadcasting Network. The Harvest Show is produced by LaCie Broadcasting and is viewer supported by people just like you. Thank you for inviting us into your home today.